Hey guys, welcome back. I'm starting a new um, audiobook. So we're going to be reading The Body Electric. So that's what's on the agenda. So here we go. The Body Electric, Electromagnetism and the Foundation of Life by Robert O. Becker, MD, and Gary Selden. Introduction, The Promise of Art. I remember how it was before penicillin. I was a medical student at the end of World War II before the drug became widely available for civilian use. And I watched the wards at New York's Bellevue Hospital fill to overflowing each winter. A veritable Byzantine city unto itself, Bellevue sprawled over four city blocks, its smelly antiquated buildings jammed together at odd angles and interconnected by a rabbit warren of underground tunnels. In wartime New York, swollen with workers, sailors, soldiers, drunks, refugees, and their diseases from all over the world, it was perhaps the place to get an all-inclusive medical education. Bellevue's charter decreed that no matter how full it was, every patient who needed hospitalization had to be admitted. As a result, beds were packed together side by side. First in the aisles, then into, then out into the corridor. A ward was closed only when it was physically impossible to get another bed out of the elevator. Most of these patients had low bar pneumococcal pneumonia. It didn't take long to develop. The bacteria multiplied unchecked, spilling over from the lungs into the bloodstream. And within three to five days of the first symptom of the crisis came. The fever rose to 104 or 105 degrees Fahrenheit and delirium set in. At that point, we had two signs to go by. If the skin remained hot and dry, the victim would die. Sweating meant the patient would pull through. Although sulfa drugs were often were effective against the milder pneumonias, the outcome in several low bar pneumonias still depended solely on the struggle between the infection and the patient's own resistance. Confident in my new medical knowledge, I was horrified to find that we were powerless to change the course of this infection in any way. It's hard for anyone who hasn't lived through the transition to realize the change that penicillin wrought. A disease with a mortality rate near 50% that killed almost 100,000 Americans each year, that struck rich as well as poor and young as well as old, and against which we had no defense, could suddenly be cured without fail in a few hours by a pinch of white powder. Most doctors who have graduated since 1950 have never seen pneumonia in crisis. Although penicillin's impact on medical practice was profound, its impact on the philosophy of medicine was even greater. When Alexander Fleming noticed in 1928 that an accidental infestation of the mold penicillin notatum had killed his bacteria cultures, he made the crowning discovery of scientific medicine. Bacteriology and sanitation had already vanquished the great plagues. Now penicillin and subsequent antibiotics defeated the last of the invisibility, invisibly tiny predators. The drugs also completed a change in medicine that had been gathering strength since the 19th century. Before that time, medicine had been an art. The masterpiece, a cure, resulted from the patient's will combined with the physician's intuition and skill in using remedies culled from millennia of observant trial and error. In the last two centuries, medicine more and more has come to be a science and more accurately the application of one science, namely biochemistry. Medical techniques have come to be tested as much against current concepts in biochemistry as against their empirical results. 
Techniques that don't fit such chemical concepts, even if they seem to work, have been abandoned as pseudoscientific or downright fraudulent. At the same time and part of the same process, life itself can came to be defined as purely chemical phenomenon. Attempts to find a soul, a vital spark, a subtle something that set living matter apart from the non-living had failed. As our knowledge of the kaleidoscopic activity within cells grew, life came to be seen as an array of chemical reactions, fantastically complex, but no different in kind from the simpler reactions performed in every high school lab. It seemed logical to assume that the ills of our chemical flesh could be cured best by the right chemical antidote, just as penicillin wiped out bacterial invaders without harming human cells. A few years later, the decipherment of the DNA code seemed to give such stout evidence of life's chemical basis that the double helix became one of the most hypnotic symbols of our age. It seemed the final proof that we'd evolved through four billion years of chance molecular encounters, aided by no guiding principle but the changeless properties of the atoms themselves. The philosophical result of chemical medicine's success has been belief in the technological fix. Drugs became the best or only valid treatments for all ailments. Prevention, nutrition, exercise, lifestyle, the patient's physical and mental uniqueness, environmental pollutants, all were glossed over. Even today, after so many years and millions of dollars spent the negligible results, it's still assumed that the cure for cancer will be a chemical that kills malignant cells without harming healthy ones. As surgeons became more adept at repairing bodily structures or replacing them with artificial parts, the technological faith came in came to include the idea that transplanted kidney, a plastic heart valve, or a stainless steel and Teflon hip joint was just as good as the original or even better because it wouldn't wear out as fast. The idea of a bionic human was the natural outgrowth of the rapture over penicillin. If a human is merely a chemical machine, then the ultimate human is a robot. No one who's seen the decline of pneumonia and the thousand other infectious disease infectious diseases or has seen the eyes of a dying patient who's just been given another decade by a new heart valve will deny the benefits of technology. But most, but as most advances do, this one has cost us something irreplaceable. Medicine's humanity. There's no room in technological medicine for any presumed sanctity or uniqueness of life. There's no need for the patient's own self-healing force, nor any strategy for enhancing it. Treating a life as a chemical automation seem, means that it makes no difference whether the doctor cares about or even knows the patient, or whether the patient likes or trusts the doctor. Because of what medicine left behind, we now find ourselves in a real technological fix. The problem to humanity of, the fu of a huge future of golden health and extended life has turned out to be empty. Degenerative diseases, heart attacks, arteriosclerosis, cancer, stroke, arthritis, hypertension, ulcers, and all the rest have replaced infectious diseases as the major enemies of life and destroyers of its quality. Modern medicine's incredible cost has put it farther than ever out of reach of the poor and now threatens to sink the Western economies themselves. Our cures too often have turned out to be a double-edged sword, later producing a secondary disease. Then we search desperately for another cure. And then the dehumanized treatment of symptoms rather than the patients has alienated many of those who can afford to pay. The result has been a sort of medical schizophrenia in which many have forsaken establishment medicine in favor of a holistic, pre-scientific type that too often neglects technology's real advantages, but at least stresses the doctor-patient relationship, preventative care, and nature's innate recuperative power. The failure of technological medicine is due, paradoxically, it is success, which it at first seemed to, so overwhelming that it swept away all aspects of medicine as an art. 
No longer a compassionate healer working at the beside, bedside and using heart and hands as well as mind, the physician has become an impersonal, impersonal white gown ministrant who works in an office or laboratory. Too many physicians no longer learn from their patients, only from their professors. The breakthroughs against infections convinced the profession of its own infallibility and quickly ossified its beliefs into dogma. Life processes that were inexplicable according to current biochemistry have been either ignored or misinterpreted. In effect, scientific medicine abandoned the center role, central role of science, revision in light of new data. As a result, the constant widening of horizons that has kept physics so vital hasn't occurred in medicine. The mechanistic assumptions behind today's medicine are left over from the turn of the century. When science was forcing dogmatic religion to see the evidence of evolution. The re-eruption of this same conflict today shows that the battle against frozen thinking is never finally won. Advances in cybernetics, ecological and nutritional chemistry and solid state physics haven't been integrated into bi biology. Some fields such as parapsychology have been closed out of mainstream scientific inquiry altogether. Even the genetic technology that now commands such breathless administration is based on principles unchallenged for decades and unconnected to a broader concept of life. Medical research, which has limited itself almost exclusively to drug therapy, might as well be have been wearing blinders for the last 30 years. It's no wonder then that medical biology is afflicted with a kind of tunnel vision. We know a great deal about certain processes such as genetic code, the function of the nervous system and vision, muscle movement, blood clotting, and respiration in both the somatic and the cellular le levels. These complex but superficial processes, however, are only the tools life use, uses for its survival. Most biochemists and the doctors aren't much closer to the truth about life than we were three decades ago. As Albert Sigent Gorgi, the discoverer of vitamin C has written, we know life only by its symptoms. We understand virtually nothing about such basic life functions as pain, sleep, and the control of cell differentiation, growth, and healing. We know little about the way every organism regulates its metabolic activity and cycles attuned to the fluctuations of earth, moon, and sun. We're ignorant about nearly every aspect of consciousness, which may be broadly defined as the self-interested integrity that lets each living thing marshal its responses to eat, thrive, reproduce, and avoid danger by patterns that range from the tropisms of a single cells to instinct, choice, memory, learning, individuality and creativity in more complex life forms. The problem of when to pull the plug shows that we don't even know for sure how to diagnose death. Mechanistic chemistry isn't adequately to understand these enigmas of life and it now acts as a barrier to studying them. Erwin Chargaff, the biochemist who discovered base pairing in DNA and thus opened the way for understanding gene structure, phrased our dilemma precisely when he wrote of biology. No other science deals in its very name with a subject that it can not define. Given the present climate, I've been a lucky man. I haven't been a good, efficient doctor in the modern sense. I've spent far too much time on a few incurable patients whom no one else wanted, trying to find out how, to, how our ignorance failed them. I've been able to tack against the prevailing winds of orthodoxy and indulge my passion for experiment. In doing so, I've been part of a little known research effort that has made a new start towards a definition of life. My research began with experiments on regeneration, the ability of some animals, notably the salamander, to grow perfect replacements for parts of the body that have been destroyed. These studies described in 
part one led to the discovery of a hitherto unknown aspect of animal life. The existence of electrical currents in parts of the nervous system. This breakthrough in turn led to a better understanding of bone fracture healing, new possibilities for cancer research and the hope of human generation regeneration even of the heart and spinal cord in the not too distant future, advances that are discussed in parts two and three, finally knowledge of life's electrical dimension has yielded fundamental insights considered in part four into pain, healing, growth, consciousness, the nature of itself, of life itself, and the dangers of our electromagnetic technology. I believe these discoveries presage, presage a revolution in biology and medic, medicine. One day they may enable the physician to control and stimulate healing at will. I believe this new knowledge will also turn medicine in the direction of a greater humility, where we should see what, the, what that whatever we achieve pales before the self-healing power latent in all organisms. The results set forth in the following pages have convinced me that our understanding of life will always be imperfect. I hope this realization will make medicine no less a science, yet more of an art again. Only then can it deliver its promised freedom from disease. Part one, growth and regrowth, salamander. Energy seed sleeping entered in the marrow. Quote by Octavio, pause. One, Hydra's heads and Medusa's blood. There is only one health, but diseases are many. Likewise, there appears to be one fundamental force that heals. Although the myriad schools of medicine all have their favorite ways of cajoling it into action. Our prevailing mythology desires the existence of any such generalized force in favor of thousands of little ones sitting of, on pharmacist shelves each one potent against only a few elements or even part of one. The system often works fairly well, especially for treatment of bacterial diseases, but it's no different in kind from earlier systems in which a specific saint or deity presided over a specific healing herb, had charge of each malady and each part of the body. Modern medicine didn't spring full blown from the heads of Pasteur and Lister a hundred years ago. If we go back further, we find that most medical systems have combined such specifics with a direct unitary appeal to the same vital principle in all illnesses. The inner force can be tapped in many ways, but all variations of four main overlapping form, four main overlapping patterns faith healing, magic healing, psychic healing, and spontaneous healing. Although science decides all four, derides all four, they sometimes seem to work as well for degenerative diseases and long-term healing as most of what Western medicine can offer. Faith healing creates a trance of belief in both patient and practitioner as the latter acts as an intercessor or conduit between the sick mortal and a presumed higher power. Since failures are usually ascribed to a lack of faith by the patient, this brand of medicine has always been a gold mine for charlatans. When bona fide, it seems to be an escalation of the placebo effect, which produces improvement in roughly one third of subjects who think are being treated, but are actually being given dummy pills and tests of new drugs. 
Faith healing requires even more confidence from the patient. So the disbeliever probably can prevent a cure and settle for the poor satisfaction of, I told you so. If even a few of these off-attested cases are genuine, however, the healed one suddenly finds faith turned into certainty as the withered arm aches with unaccustomed sensation, like a starved animal waking from hibernation. Magic healing shifts the emphasis from the patient's faith to the doctor's trained will and occult learning. The legend of Teta, an Egyptian magician from the time of Khufu, Cheops, builder of the Great Pyramid, can serve as an example. At the age of 110, Teta was summoned into the royal presence to demonstrate his ability to rejoin a, a severed head to its body, restoring life. Khufu ordered a prisoner beheaded, but Teta discreetly suggested that he would like to confine himself to laboratory animals for the moment. So a goose was decapitated. Its body was laid at one end of the hall, its head at the other. Teta repeatedly pronounced his words of power at each time. The head and the body twitched a little closer to each other until finally the two sides of the cut met. They quickly fused and the bird stood up and began cackling. Some considered the legendary miracles of Jesus part of the same ancient tradition learned during Christ's precocious childhood in Egypt. Whether or not we believe in the literal truth of these particular accounts over the years, so many otherwise reliable witness, witnesses have testified to healing miracles that it seems presumptuous to dismiss them all as fabrications. Based on the material presented in this book, I suggest Coldridge, Coleridge's willingness, suspension of belief, disbelief until we understand healing better. Shamans apparently once served at least some of their patients well and still do where they survive on the fringes of the industrial world. Magical medicine suggests that our search for the healing power isn't so much an exploration as an act of remembering something that was once intuitively ours. The form of recall in which the knowledge is passed on or awakened by initiation and apprenticeship to the man or woman of power. Sometimes, however, the secret needn't be revealed to be useful. Many psychic healers have been studied, especially in the Soviet Union, whose gift is unconscious, unsought, and usually discovered by accident. One who demonstrated his talents in the West was Oscar Estebani, Hungarian army colonel in the mid-1930s. Estebani, and that's spelled E-S-T-E-B-A-N-Y. Estebani noticed that horses he groomed got their wind back and recovered from illnesses faster than those cared for by others. He observed and used his powers informally for years until forced to immigrate after the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. He settled in Canada and came to the attention of Dr. Bernard Grad, a biologist at McGill University. Grad found that, that Estebani could accelerate the healing of measured skin wounds made on the backs of mice as compared with controls. He didn't let Estebani touch the animals, but only placed his hands near the cages because handling it itself would have fostered healing. Estebani also spent speeded up the growth of barley plants and reactivated ultraviolet violet damage samples of the stomach enzyme trypsin in much the same way as a magnetic field, even though no magnetic field could be detected near his body with the instruments of that era. The types of healing we've considered so far have trance and touch as common factors, but some modes don't even require a healer. Spontaneous miracles at Lourdes and other religious shrines require only a vision, fervent prayer, perhaps a momentary connection with a holy relic, an intense concentration on the diseased organ or limb. 
Other reports suggest that only the intense concentration is needed, the rest being aids to that end. When Diomedes in the fifth book of the Iliad dislocates Aeneas' hip with a rock, Apollo takes the Trojan hero to a temple of healing and restores full use of his leg within minutes. Hector later receives the same treatment after a rock in the chest fails him. We could dismiss these accounts as the hyperbole of a great poet if Homer weren't so realistic in other battlefield details. And if we didn't have similar accounts of soldiers in recent wars recovering from mortal wounds or fighting on white oblivious to injuries that would normally cause excruciating pain. British Army Surgeon Lieutenant Colonel H.K. Beecher described 225 years, 225 such cases in print after World War II. One soldier at Anzio in 1943 who had eight ribs severed near the spine by shrapnel with punctures of the kidney and lung, who was turning blue and near death, kept trying to get off his litter because he thought he was lying on his rifle. His bleeding abated, his color returned, and the massive wound began to heal after no treat treatment. But an insignificant dose of sodium amytal, a weak sedative given him because there was no morphine. These occasional prodigies of battlefield stress strongly resemble the ability of yogis to control pain, stop bleeding, and speedily heal wounds with their will alone. Biofeedback research at the Menninger Foundation and elsewhere has shown that some of the same power can be tapped in people with no yogic training, that the will can be applied to the body's ills has also been shown by Norman Cousins in his Resolute Conquest by Laugh Therapy of Ankylizing Lossing Spondylitis, a crippling disease in which the spinal disc and ligaments solidify like bone. By some similar successes by users of visualization techniques to focus the mind against the cancer. Unfortunately, no approach is a sure thing. In our ignorance, the common denominator of all healing, even the chemical cues we profess to understand, remains its mysteriousness. Its unpredictability has bedeviled doctors throughout history. Physicians can offer no reason. by one patient, sorry. Physicians can offer no reason why one patient will respond to a tiny dose of a medicine that has no effect on one another patient in 10 times the amount, or why some cancers go into remission while others grow relentlessly into death. By whatever means, if the energy is successfully focused, it results in a marvelous transformation. What seemed like an inexorable decline suddenly reverses itself. Healing can almost be defined as a miracle. Instant regrowth of damaged parts and invincibility against disease are commonplace of the divine world. They continually appear in myths that have nothing to do with the theme of healing itself. Dead Vikings went to a realm where they could savor the joys of killing all day long, knowing their wounds would heal in time for the next day's mayhem. Prometheusly, endlessly regrowing liver was only a clever torture arranged by G Zeus so that the eagle sent as a punishment for the god's delivery of fire to mankind could feast on his most vital organ forever. Although the tale also suggests that the prehistoric Greeks knew something of the liver's ability to enlarge and compensation for damage to it. The Hydra was adept at these offhand wonders too. This was the monster Hercules had to kill as his second chore for the king, Aristheus. The beast had somewhere between seven and hundred heads. 
and each time Hercules cut one off, two new ones sprouted in its place until the hero got the idea of having his nephew Aeolus Cataraus each neck as soon as the head hit the ground. In the 18th century, the Hydra's name was given to a tiny aquatic animal set having seven to 12 heads or tentacles on a hollow stalk-like body because this creature can regenerate. The mythic Hydra remains a symbol of that ability possessed to some degree by most animals, including us. Generation, life's normal transformation from seed to adult would seem as unearthly as regeneration if it were not so commonplace. We see the same kinds of changes in each. The Greek hero Cadmus grows an army by sowing the teeth of a dragon he has killed. The primeval serpent makes love to the world egg which hatches all the creatures of the earth. God makes Adam from Eve's rib or vice versa in the latter version. The word of God commands life to unfold. The genetic words encoded in DNA spell out the unfolding. At successive but still limited levels of understanding, each of these beliefs tries to account for the beautifully bizarre metamorphosis. And if some savage told us a magical worm that built a little windowless house slept there a season, then one day emerged and flew away as a jeweled bird, we'd laugh at such superstition if we'd never seen a butterfly. The healer's job was always been to release something not understood, to re remove obstructions, demons, germs, despair, between the sick patient and the force of life driving obscurely toward wholeness. The means may be direct, psychic methods mentioned above or indirect. Herbs can be used to stimulate recovery. This tradition extends from prehistoric wise women through the Greek herbal of Diosaurides and those of Renaissance Europe to the prevailing drug therapies of the present Fasting, controlled nutrition, and regulation of living habitats to avoid stress can be used to, co to coax the latent healing force from the sick body. We can trace this approach back from today's nurture past to Galen and Hippocrates. Attendance at the healing temples of ancient Greece and Egypt worked to foster a dream in the patient that would either start the creative process in sleep or tell what must be done on awakening. Attendance at the healing temples of ancient Greece and Egypt worked to foster a dream in the patient that would either start the curative process in sleep or tell what must be done on awakening. This method has gone out of style, but it must have worked fairly well for the temples were filled with the plaques inscribed by grateful patrons who'd recovered. In fact, this mode was so esteemed that Esculapus, the legendary doctor who originated it, was said to have been given two vials filled with the blood of Medusa, the snaky haired witch queen killed by Perseus. Blood from her left side restored life, while that from her right took it away. And that's a succinct a description of the tricky art of medicine as we're likely to find. The more I consider the origins of medicine, the more I've convinced that all true physicians seek the same thing. The gulf between fork therapy and our own stainless steel version is illusory. Western medicine springs from the same roots and, and the final analysis acts through the same little understood forces as its country cousins. Our doctors ignore this kinship at their, and worse, their patient's peril. All worthwhile medical research and every medicine man's intuition is a part of the same quest for knowledge of the same elusive healing energy. Failed healing in the bone. As an orthopedic surgeon, I often pondered one particular breakdown of that energy. My specialties major unsolved problem, 
non-union of fractures. Normally a broken bone will begin to grow together in a few weeks if the, end, if the ends are held close to each other without movement. Occasionally, however, a bone will refuse to knit despite a year or more of tests and surgery. This is a disaster for the patient and a bitter defeat for the doctor, who must amputate the arm or leg and fit the prosthetic substitute. Throughout this century, most biologists have been sure only chemical processes were involved in growth and healing. As a result, most work on non-unions has concentrated on calcium metabolism and hormone relationships. Surgeons have also freshened or scraped the fracture surfaces and devised ever more complicated plates and screws to hold the bone ends rigidly in place. This, these approaches seem superficial to me. I doubted that we would ever understand the failure to heal unless we truly understood healing itself. When I began my research career in 1958, we already knew a lot about the logistics of bone mending. It seemed to involve two separate processes, one of which looked altogether different from healing elsewhere in the human body. But we lacked any idea of what set these processes in motion and controlled them to produce a bone bridge across the break. Stages of fractured healing. Every bone is wrapped in a layer of tough fibrous collagen, a protein that's a major ingredient of bone itself and also forms the connective tissue or glue that fastens all, all our cells to each other. Underneath collagen envelope are the cells that produce it, right next to the bone. Together, the two layers form the peristeme, periosteme. When a bone breaks, these periosteal cells divide in a particular way. One of the daughter cells stays where it is, while the other one migrates into the blood clot surrounding the fracture and changes into a closely related type, an osteoblast or a bone forming cell. These new osteoblasts build a swollen ring of bone called a callus around the break. Another repair operation is going on inside the bone in its hollow center, the medullary cavity. In childhood, the marrow in this cavity actively produces red and white blood cells. While in adulthood, most of the marrow turns to fat. Some active marrow cells remain. However, in porous convolutions of the inner surface, around the break, a new tissue forms from the marrow cells, most readily in children and young animals. This new tissue is unspecialized and the marrow cells seem to form, if not increasingly, their rate of division as in the callus forming posterior cells, but by reverting into a primitive neoembryotic state. The unspecialized former marrow cells and then the change into a type of primitive cartilage cells and into mature cartilage cells and finally into bone cells to help heal the break from inside. Under a microscope, the changes seen in cells from this internal healing area, especially from children a week or two after the bone was broken, seem incredibly chaotic and they look frighteningly similar to highly malignant bone cancer cells. But in most cases, their transformations are under control and the bone heals. Dr. Marshall Urist, one of the great researchers in orthopedics was to conclude in early 1960s that this second type of bone healing is an evolutionary throwback, the only kind of regeneration that humans share with all other vertebrates. Regeneration is this sense means the regrowth of a complex body part consisting of several different kinds of cells in a fashion resembling the original growth of the same part in this embryo in which the necessary cells differentiate from simpler cells or even from seemingly unrelated types. 
This process, which I call true regeneration, must be distinguished from two other forms of healing. One, sometimes considered a variety of regeneration, is physiological repair, in which small wounds and everyday wear within a single tissue are made good by nearby cells of the same type, which merely proliferate to close the gap. The other kind of healing occurs when a wound is too big for single tissue repair, but the animal lacks the true regenerative competence to restore the damaged part. In this case, the injury is simply patched over as well as possible with collagen, fibers forming a scar. Since true regeneration is most closely related to embryonic development and is generally strongest in simple animals, it may be considered the most fundamental mode of healing. Non-unions failed to knit, I reasoned, because they were missing something that triggered and controlled normal healing. I already begun to wonder if the inner area of bone mending might be a vestige of true regeneration. If so, it would likely show the control process in a clearer or more basic form than the other two kinds of healing. I figured I stood little chance of isolating a clue to it in the multi-level turmoil of a broken bone itself. So I resolved to study regeneration alone as it occurred in other animals. A fable made fact. Regeneration happens all the time in the plant kingdom. Certainly, this knowledge was acquired very early in mankind's history. Besides locking up their future generations in this mysterious seed, many plants, such as grapevines, could form a new plant from a single part of the old. Some classical authors had an inkling of animal regeneration. Aristotle mentions that the eyes of a very young swallows recover from injury, and Pliny notes that lost tails of octopi and lizards regrow. However, regrowth was thought to be almost exclusively a plant prerogative. The great French scientist René Antoine Fréchat de Ramer made the first scientific description of animal regeneration in 1712. Ramer devoted all his life to the study of insects which at that time meant all invertebrates, everything that was obviously lower than lizards, frogs, and fish. In studies of crayfish, lobsters, and crabs, Ramer proved the claims of Breton fishermen that these animals could regrow lost legs. He kept crayfish in the live bait, well, of a fishing boat, removing a claw from each and observing that the amputated extremity reproduced in full anatomical detail. A tiny replica of the limb took shape inside the shell. When the shell was discarded at the next molting season, a new limb unfolded and grew to full size. Ramer was one of the scientific geniuses of his time. Elected to the Royal Academy of Sciences, when only 24, he went on to invent tinned steel Ramer porcelain and opaque, opaque white glass imitation pearls, better ways of forging iron, egg incubators, and the Ramer thermometer, which is still used in France. At the age of 69, he isolated gastric juice from the stomach and described its digestive function. Despite his other accomplishments, insects were his life's love. He never married, and he probably was the first to conceive of the vast, diverse population of life forms that this term encompassed. He rediscovered the ancient royal purple dye from the Murex trunculus, a marine mollusk, and his work on spinning a fragile, filmy silk from the spider webs was translated into Manchu for the Chinese emperor. He was the first to elucidate the social life and sexually divided caste system of bees. Due to this, 
Due to his eclipse in later years by court-supported scientists who valued common sense over observation, Vermeer's exhaustive study of ants wasn't published until 1926. In the interim, it had taken several generations of pharmacologists to cover the same ground, including the description of winged ants copulating in flight and proof that there aren't a separate species but the sexual form of wingless ants. In 1734, he published the first of six volumes of his Natural History of Insects, a milestone in biology. Ramir made so many contributions to science that his study of regeneration was overlooked for decades. At that time, no one really cared what strange things these unimportant animals did. However, all of the master's work was well known to a younger naturalist, Abraham Tremblay of Geneva, who supported himself, as did many educated men of that time by serving as a private tutor for sons of wealthy families. In 1740, while he employed at an estate near The Hague in Holland, Tremblay was examining with a hand lens the small animals living in freshwater ditches and ponds. Many had been described by Ramir, but Tremblay chanced upon an old, odd new one. It was no more than a quarter of an inch long and faintly resembled a squid. Having a cylindrical body topped with a crown of tentacles. However, it was a startling green color. To Tremblay, green meant vegetation. But if this was a plant, it was a mighty peculiar one. When Tremblay agitated the water in its dish, the tentacles contracted and the body shrank down to a nubbin only to re-expand after a period of quiet. Strangest of all, he saw that the creature was walked by somersaulting end over end. Since they had the power of locomotion, Trembley would have assumed that these creatures were animals and moved on to another observation. If he hadn't chanced to find a species colored green by symbiotic algae. To settle the animal plant question, he decided to cut some in half if they regrew, they must be plants with the unusual ability to walk. While if they couldn't regenerate, they must be green animals. Trembley soon entered into a world that exceeded his wildest dreams. He divided the polyps, as he first called them, in the middle of their stalks. He then had two short pieces of a stalk, one with attached tentacles, each of which contracted down to a tiny dot. Patiently watching, Trembley saw the two pieces later expand. The tentacle portion began to move abnormally, as though it were a complete organism. The other portion lay inert and apparently dead. Something must have made Trembley continue the experiment, for he watched his motionless object for nine days, during which nothing happened. He then noted that the cut in sprouted three little horns. And within few more days, the complete crown of the tentacles had been restored. Tremley now had two complete polyps as a result of cutting one in half. However, even though they regenerated, more observation convinced Tremblay that the creatures were really animals. Not only did they move and walk, but their arms captured tiny water fleas and moved them to the mouth located in the center of the ring of the tentacles, which promptly swallowed the prey. Tremblay, then only 31, decided to make sure he was right by having the great Vermeer confirm his findings before he published them and possibly made a fool of himself. He sent specimens and detailed notes to Vermeer, who confirmed that, his, that this was an animal with amazing powers of regeneration then he immediately read Tremblay's letters and showed his specimens to astounded Royal Academy early in 1741. The official report called Tremblay's polyp more marvelous than the phoenix or the mythical serpent that could join together after being cut in two, for these legendary animals could only reconstitute themselves 
while the polyps could make a duplicate. Years later, Ramir was still thunderstruck. As he wrote in volume six of his series on insects, this is a fact that I cannot accustom myself to seeing after having seen and re-seen it a hundred times. This was just the beginning, however. Trembley's polyps performed even more wondrous feats. When cut lengthwise, each half of the stalk healed over without a scar and proceeded to regrow the missing tentacles. Trembley minced some polyps into as many pieces as he could manage, finding that a complete animal would regrow from each piece as long as it included a remnant of the central stalk. In one instance, he quartered one of the creatures, then cut each resulting polyp into three or four pieces until he had made 50 animals from one. His most famous experiment was the other, the one that led him to name his polyp Hydra. He found that by splitting the head lengthwise, leaving the stalk intact, he could produce one animal with two crowns of tentacles. By continuing the process, he was able to get one animal with seven heads. When Trembley lopped them off, each one regrew just like the mythical beasts. But nature went legend one better. Each severed head went on to form a complete new animal as well. Such experiments provided our first proof that entire animals can regenerate. And Trembley went on to observe that hydras could reproduce by simple budding. A small animal appeared on one side on the side of the stalk and growing to full size. The implications of these discoveries were so revolutionary that Trembley delayed publishing a full account of his work until he'd been prodded by Remure and preceded in print by several others. A sharp division between plant and animal suddenly grew blurred, suggesting a common origin with some kind of evolution. Basic assumptions about life had to be rethought. As a result, Trembley's Trimley's observations weren't enthusiastically embraced by all. They inflamed several old arguments and offended many of the old guard. In this respect, Trimley's mentor, Ramur, was, almost, was a most unusual scientist from his time. And indeed, for all time, despite his prominence, he was ready to espouse radically new ideas, and most important, he didn't steal the ideas of others an all too common failing among scientists. A furious debate was raging at the time of Trembley's announcement. It concerned the origin of the individual, how the chicken came from the egg, for example. When scientists examined the newly laid egg, there wasn't much there, there except two liquids, the white and the yolk, neither of which had discernible structure, let alone anything resembling a chicken. There were two opposite theories. The older one derived from Aristotle held that each animal in all its complexity developed from a simple organic matter by a process called epigenesis, akin to our modern concept of cell differentiation. Unfortunately, Trembley himself was the first person to witness cell division under the microscope, and he didn't realize that it was the normal process by which all cells multiplied. In an era knowing nothing of genes and so little of cells, yet beginning to insist on logical scientific explanations, epigenesis seemed more and more absurd. What could possibly transform the gelatin of eggs and sperm into a frog or a human? Without invoking that tired old deuce ex machina, the spirit, or an inexplicable spark of life, Unless the frog or person already existed in a miniature inside the generative slime and merely grew in the course of development. The latter idea called preformation had been ascendant for at least 50 years. It was so widely accepted that when the early 
microscopists studied drops of se semen, they dutifully reported a little man called homunculus encased in the head of each sperm. Fine example of science's cap capacity for self-delusion. Even Ramier, when he failed to find tiny butterfly wings inside caterpillars, assumed they were there but were too small to be seen. Only a few months before Trembley began slicing hydras, his cousin Genevan naturalist Charles Bonnet had proven, Charles Bonnet had proven an experiment suggested by the omnipresent Ramier that female aphids usually reproduce pathogenically parthenogenetically without mating. To Bonnet, his dem this demonstration, this demonstrated that the tiny adult resided in the egg. He became the leader of the ovist preformationist. The hydra's regeneration and similar powers in starfish, sea anemones and worms put the scientific establishment on the defensive. Ramir had long ago realized that the performation couldn't explain how a baby inherited traits from both father and mother. The notion of two homun homunculi fusing into one seed seemed far-fetched. His regrowing crayfish claw showed that each leg would have to contain little preformed legs scattered throughout. And since a regenerated leg could be lost and replaced many times, the proto legs would have to be very numerous, yet no one had ever found any. Regeneration, therefore, suggested some form of epigenesis, perhaps without a soul. However, for the hydrous animal, if it existed, it was divisible along with the body and indistinguishable from it. It seemed as though some forms of matter itself possessed a spark of life, a lack of knowledge of cells, let alone chromosomes and genes. The epigeneticists were unable to prove their case. Each side could only point out the other's inconsistencies. And politics gave preformationism the edge. No wonder non-scientists often grew impatient of the whole argument. Oliver Goldsmith and Tobias Smollett mocked the naturalist for missing nature's grandeur and their myopic fascination with muckflies. Henry Fielding lampooned the discussion in a skit about the regeneration of money. Diderot thought of hydras as composite animals like swarms of bees in which each particle had a vital spark of its own and lightheartedly suggested there might be human polyps on Jupiter and Saturn. Voltaire was derisively skeptical of attempts to infer the nature of the soul, animal or human from these experiments, referring in, in 1768 to the regenerating heads of snails, he asked, what happens to its sensorum, its memory, its store of ideas, its soul, when its head has been cut off? How does all this come back? The soul that is reborn is an extremely curious phenomenon. Profoundly disturbed by the whole affair, for a long time, he simply refused to believe in animal regeneration, calling the hydra a kind of small rush. It was no longer possible to doubt the discovery after the work of Lazaro Spallanzani, an Italian priest who soon, whom science was a full-time hobby. In a career spanning the second half of the 18th century, Spallanzani discovered the reversal of plant transpiration between light and darkness and advanced our knowledge of digestion, volcanoes, blood circulation, and the senses of bats. But his most important work concerned regrowth. In 20 years of meticulously observation, he studied regeneration in worms, slugs, snails, salamanders, and tadpoles. He set new standards for thoroughness, often dissecting the amputated parts to make sure he'd removed them whole, then dissecting the replacements a few months later to confirm that all the parts had been restored. Spallanzani's most important contribution to science was his discovery of the regenerative abilities of the salamander. It could replace its tail and limbs all at once if need be. 
A young one performed this feat for Spallanzani six times in three months. He later found that the salamander could also replace its jaw and the lenses of its eyes and then went on to establish two general rules of regeneration. Simple animals can regenerate more fully than complex ones, or in modern terms, the ability to regenerate declines as one moves up the evolutionary scale. The salamander is the main exception. In autogenic parallel, if a species can regenerate, younger individuals do it better than older ones. This early regeneration research, Spallanzani in particular, was a benchmark in modern biology. Gentlemanly observations buttressed by common sense gave way to a more rigorous kind of examination in which nothing was taken for granted. It had been known for perhaps 10,000 years that plants could regenerate and animals couldn't. To many zoologists, even 20 years after Tremley's initial discovery, the few known exceptions only proved the rule for octopi, crayfish, hydras, worms, and snails seemed so unlike humans or the familiar mammals that they hardly counted. The lizard, the only other vertebrate regenerator then known, could manage no more than an imperfect tail. But the salamander here was an animal we could relate to. This was no worm or snail or microscopic dot but a four-limbed, two-eyed vertebrate that could walk and swim. While its legendary ability to withstand fire had been disproven, its body was a big enough and its anatomy similar enough to ours to be taken seriously. Scientists could no longer assume that the underlying process had nothing to do with us. In fact, the questions which Spallanzani ended his first report on the salamander have haunted biologists ever since. It is to be hoped that higher animals may acquire the same power by some useful dispositions. And should the flattering expectation of obtaining this advantage for ourselves be considered entirely as chimerical? Chapter two, the embryo at the wound. Regeneration was largely forgotten for a century. Spallanzani had been so thorough that little else could be learned about it with techniques of that time. Moreover, although his work strongly supported epigenesis, its impact was lost because the whole debate was swallowed up in the much larger philosophical conflict between vitalism and mechanism. Since biology includes the study of our own essence, it's the most emotional science and it has been the battleground for these two points of view throughout its history. Briefly, the vitalist believed in a spirit called the anima or l'an vital that made living things fundamentally different from other substances. The machinist, the mechanist believed that life could ultimately be understood in terms of the same physical and chemical laws that govern non-living matter, and that only ignorance of these forces led people to invoke such hokum as a spirit. We'll take up these issues in more detail later, but for now we need only note that the vitalist favored epigenesis, viewed as an imposition of order on the chaos of the egg by some intangible vital force. The, me the mechanists favored preformation. Since science insisted increasingly on material explanations for everything, epigenesis lost, our, lost out despite the evidence of regeneration. Mechanism dominated biology more and more, but some problems remained. The main one was the absence of the little man and the sperm. Advances in the power and resolution of microscopes had clearly shown that no one was there. Biologists were faced with the 
generative slime again. Featureless goo from which slowly and magically an organism appeared. After 1850, biology began to break up into various specialties. Embryology, the study of development, was named and promoted by Darwin himself. who ho hoped in vain that it would reveal a precise history of evolution. Phylogeny recapitulated in the growth process, ontogeny. In the 1880s, embryology matured as an experimental science under the leadership of two Germans, Wilhelm Ruh and August Weismann. Ruh studied the stages of embryonic growth in a very restricted mechanistic way that revealed itself in, even in the formal Germanic title. Entwicklungsmechanik, or developmental mechanics, that he applied to the whole field. Weissman, however, was more interested in inheritance past the instructions from one embryonic form from one generation to the next. One phenomenon, mitosis or cell division, was basic to both transactions. No matter how embryos grew and heredity traits were transferred, both processes had to be accomplished by cellular actions. Although we're taught in high school that Robert Hooke discovered the cell in 1665, he really discovered that cork was full of microscopic holes, which he called cells because they looked like little rooms. The idea that they were the basic structure units of all living things came from Theodore Schwann, who proposed this cell theory in 1838. However, even at that late date, he didn't even have a clear idea of the origin of cells. Mitosis was unknown to him, and he wasn't too sure of this distinction between plants and animals. His theory wasn't fully accepted until two other German biologists, F.A. Schneider and Otto Buschli, Buschli reintroduced Swan's concept and described mitosis in 1873. Observations of embryogenesis soon confirmed its cellular basis. The fertilized egg was exactly that, a seemingly unstructured single cell. Embryonic growth occurred when the fertilized egg divided into two other cells, which promptly divided again. Their progeny then divided and so on. And they proliferated. The cells also differentiated. That is, they began to show specific characteristics of muscle, cartilage, nerve, and so forth. The creature that resulted obviously had several increasingly complex levels of organization. However, Rue and Weissman had no alternative but to concentrate on the lowest one, the cell, and try to imagine how the inherited material worked at that level. Weissman proposed a theory of determiners, specific chemical structures coded for all cells for each cell type. The fertilized egg contained all the determiners, both in type and in number, needed to produce every cell in the body. As cell division proceeded, the daughter cells each received half of the previous stock of determiners until in the adult, each cell possessed only one. Muscle cells contained only the muscle determiner, nerve cells only the one for nerves, and so on. This meant that once, once a cell's function had been fixed, it could never be anything but that one kind of cell. In one of his first experiments published in 1888, Rue obtained powerful support for this concept. He took fertilized eggs, he took fertilized frog eggs, which were large and easy to observe, and waited until the first cell division had occurred. He then separated the two cells of this incipient embryo. According to the theory, each cell contained enough determiners to make half of an embryo. And that was exactly what Rue got, two half embryos. It was hard to argue with such a clear cut result and that, terminer, and that determiner theory was widely accepted. Its triumph was a climatic victory for the mechanistic concept of life as well. One of Vitalism's last gas came from the work of another German embryologist, Hans Dreech. Initially a firm believer in Entwicklungsmechanik, 
Dreech later found its concepts deficient in the face of life's continued mysteries. For example, using sea urchin eggs, his repeaters, he, he repeated Rue's famous experiment and obtained a whole organism instead of a half. Many of the experiments convinced Dreech that life had some special innate drive, a process that went against known physical laws. Drawing on the ancient Greek idea of the anima, he proposed a non-material vital factor that he called intellectchi. The beginning of the 20th century wasn't a propitious time for such an idea, however, and it wasn't popular. Mechanics of growth. As the 19th century drew to a close close and the embryologists continued to a struggle with the problems of the inheritance, they found they still needed a substitute for the homunculus. Weissman's determiners worked fine for embryonic growth, but regeneration was a glaring exception and one that didn't prove the rule. The original theory had no provision for limited replay of growth to replace a part lost after development was finished. Oddly enough, the solution had already been provided by a man almost totally forgotten today, Theodore Heinrich Boveri. Working at the University of Munich in the 1880s, Boveri discovered almost every detail of cell division, including the chromosomes. Not until the invention of the electron microscope did anyone add material to his original descriptions. Boveri found that all non-consensual cells of any one species contained the same number of chromosomes. A growth preceded by mitosis, these chromosomes split lengthwise to make two of each so that each daughter cell then had the same number of chromosomes. The egg and the sperm divided by a special process called meiosis wound up with exactly half of that number so that the fertilized egg would start out with full complement, half from the father and half from the mother. He reached the obvious conclusions that the chromosomes transmitted heredity and that each one could exchange smaller units itself with its counterpart from the parent. Mitosis, formation of body cells. At first, this idea wasn't well received. It was strenuously opposed by Thomas Hunt Morgan, a respected embryologist at Columbia University and the first American participant in the saga. Later, the Morgan, when Morgan found that the results of his own experiments agreed with Boveri's, he went on to describe chromosome structure in more detail, charting specific positions, which he called genes inherited characteristics. The science of genetics was born. A Morgan received the Nobel Prize in 1933. So much for Bavari. Although Morgan was famous for his genetics research on fruit flies, he got his start by studying salamander limb regeneration about which he made a crucial observation. He found that the limb, the new limb was preceded by a mass of cells that appeared on the stump and resembled the unspecialized cell mass of the early embryo. He called this structure the blastema and later concluded that the problem of how a regenerated limb formed was identical to the problem of how an embryo developed from the egg. Morgan postulated that the chromosomes and genes contained not only the inheritable characteristics, but also the code for cell differentiation. A muscle cell, for example, would be formed when the group of genes specifying muscles were in action. This insight led directly to our modern understanding of the process. In the earliest ages, stages of embryo, every gene on every chromosome is active and available to every cell. As the organism develops, the cell form three rudimentary tissue layers, the endoderm, which develops into the glands and viscera, the mesoderm, which becomes the muscles, bones, and circulatory system, and the ectoderm, which gives rise to the skin, sense organs, and nervous system. Some of these genes are already being turned off or repressed at this stage. As the cells differentiate into mature tissues, only one specific set of genes stays switched on in each kind. Each set can make only certain types of messenger ribonucleic acid, mRNA, the executive secretary, chemical by means of which DNA instructs. 
the ribosomes, the cell's protein factory organelles to make the particular proteins that distinguish a nerve cell, for example, from a muscle or a cartilage cell. Messenger RNA machinery. There's a superficial similarity between this genetic mechanism and the old determiner theory. The crucial difference is that instead of determiners being segregated until only one remains in each cell, the genes are repressed until only one set remains active in each cell. However, the entire bl genetic blueprint is carried by every cell nucleus. Science is a bit like the ancient Egyptian religion, which never threw old gods away, but only tacked them onto newer deities until a bizarre hodgepodge developed. For some strange reason, scientists, science is equally reluctant to discard worn out theories. And even though there was absolutely no evidence to support it, one of Wiseman's ideas was swallowed whole by the new device, by the new science of genetics. This was the notion that differentiation was still a one-way street, that cells could never de-differentiate, that it is retrace their steps from a mature specialized state to a primitive unspecialized form. This assumption was made despite the fact that chromosomes now provided a plausible means for a reversal. Remember, all cells of the adult except the egg and the sperm contain the full array of chromosomes. All the genes are still there, even though most of them are repressed. It seems logical that when this was, when this has been locked, might be also be unlocked when their new cells are needed. But this idea was fought with unbelievable ferocity by the scientific establishment. It's difficult now to see why, since no principle of real importance was involved, except possibly a bit of the supremacy of the mechanistic outlook itself. The mechanist. The mechanist greeted the discovery of genes and chromosomes joyfully. Here at last was a replacement for the little man in the sperm. Perhaps it seemed that admitting de-differentiation would have given life too much control over its own functions. Perhaps one gene, once genes were considered the sole mechanism of life, they had to work in a nice, simple, mechanical way. As we shall see, this dogma created terrible difficulties for the studies of regeneration. After Morgan's work on salamander limb regrowth early in this century, hundreds of other experimenters studied the miracle again and again in many kinds of animals. Their labors revealed a number of general principles such as polarity, a creature's normal relationship of fronts to back and top to bottom are preserved in the regenerate. Gradients. Regenerative ability is strongest in one area of animal's body, gradually diminishing in all directions. Dominance. Some one particular section of the lost part is replaced first, followed by the others in a fixed sequence. Induction. Some parts actively trigger the formation of others later in the sequence. Inhibition. The presence of any particular parts prevents the formation of a duplicate of itself or of other parts that come from, come before that part in the sequence. All the experiments led to one unifying conclusion. The overall structure, the shape, the pattern of any animal is real. A part of its body are its cells, heart, limbs, or teeth. Living things are called organisms because of the overriding importance of organizations. And each part of the pattern somehow contains the information as to what it is in relation to the whole. The ability of this pattern to maintain itself reaches its height in the newts, mud puppies, and other amphibians collectively called salamanders. The salamander directly descended from the evolutionary prototype of all land vertebrates in a marvelous complex animal, almost as complicated as a human. 
Its forelimb is basically the same as ours, yet all its interrelated parts grow back in the proper order. The same interlocking bones and muscles, all the delicate wrist bones and the coordinated fingers and they're wired together with the proper nerve and blood vessel connections. The same day the limb is cut off, debris from dead cells is carried away in the bloodstream. And then some of the intact tissue begins to die back a short distance from the wound. During the first two or three days, cells of the epidermis, the outer layer of the skin, begin to proliferate and mi migrate inward covering the wound surface. The epidermis then thickens over the apex of the stump into a transparent tissue called the apical cap. Stage is finished in about a week. By then, the blastema, the little ball of undifferentiated cells described by Morgan, has started to appear beneath the apical cap. This is the organ or of regeneration. Forming on the wound like a miniature embryo, and very similar to the embryonic limb bud that gave rise to the leg in the first place. The cells are totipotent, able to develop into all the different kinds of cells needed to reconstitute the limb. The blastema is ready in about two weeks. Even as it's forming, the cells at its outer edge start dividing rapidly, changing the blastema shape into a cone and providing a steady source of raw material, new cells for regrowth. After about three weeks, the blastema cells at the inner edge begin to differentiate into specialized types and arrange themselves into tissues, beginning with the cartilage collar around the old bone shaft. Other tissues then form, and the new limb, beginning with the characteristic paddle shape that will become the hand, appears as though out of a mist. The elbow and long parts of the limb coalesce behind the hand and the regrowth is complete, except for some slight enlargement. When the four digits reappear after about eight, we eight weeks, this process exquisitely, beautifully, and seemingly simple is full of problems for biology. What organizes the growth? What is the control factor? How does the blastema know that it must make a foreleg instead of a hind leg? Salamander never makes a mistake. How does all the information about the missing parts get to these undifferentiated cells? Telling them what to become, which genes to activate, what proteins to make, where to position themselves. It is as if a pile of bricks were to spontaneously rearrange itself into a building, becoming not only walls, but windows, light sockets, steel beams, and furniture in the process. Answers were sought by transplanting the blastema, blastema to other positions on the animal. The experiments only made matters worse. If the blastema was moved within five to seven days after it first appeared, and the grafted near the behind leg, it grew into a second hind leg, even though it came from an amputated foreleg. Well, that was okay. The body could be divided into spheres of influence or organizational territories, each of which contained information on the local anatomy. A blastema, each tissue of the stump. A blastema put into hind limb territory naturally became a hind limb. This was an attractive theory, but unfounded. Exactly what did this territory consist of? No one knew. To make matters worse, it was then found that transplantation of a slightly older blastema from a foreleg stump into a hind limb area produced a foreleg. The young blastema knew where it was. The older one knew where it had been. Somehow, this pinhead of primitive cells with absolutely no distinguishing characteristics contained enough information to build a complete foreleg, no matter where it was placed. How? We still don't know. One attempt at the answer was an idea of a morphogenic field. 
advanced by Paul, Paul Weiss in the 1930s and developed by H.V. Bronsted in the 1950s. Morphogenesis means origin of form, and the field idea was simply an attempt to get closer to the control factor by reformulating the problem. Bronsted, a Danish biologist working on regeneration in the common flatworms known as planarians, found that two complete heads would form when he cut a strip from the center of the worm's front end, leaving two side pieces of the original head. Conversely, when he grafted two worms together side by side, their heads fused. Bronsted said an analogy with a match flame, which he could be split by cutting the match, then rejoined by putting the two halves side by side. And he suggested that part of the essence of life might be the creation of some such flame-like field. It would be like the field around a magnet, except that it reflected the magnet's internal structure and held its shape even when part of the magnet was missing. The idea grew out of the earliest, earlier experiments by Wise, an American embryologist who stymied such creative research through his dogmatism, yet still made some important contributions. Regrowth clearly wasn't a simple matter of truncated muscle or bone growing outward to resume its original shape. Structures that were missing entirely, the hand, the wrist, and the bones of the salamander's lower forelimb, for example, also reappeared. Weiss found that redundant parts could be inserted, but the essential ones couldn't be easily eliminated. If an extra bone was implanted in the limb and the cut made through the two, the regenerate contained both. However, if bone was completely removed and the incision allowed to heal, and the limb was then amputated through what would have been the middle of the missing bone, the regenerate produced that bone's lower half like a ghosting re regaining its substance. Why suggested that the other tissues besides the bone could somehow project a field that included the rearrangement of the bones. At a later student, as a later student of regeneration, Richard Goss of Brown University observed, Apparently, each tissue of the stump can vote to be represented in the blastema, and some of them can even cast absentee ballots. And that is page 52, and we're going to stop there, and we'll pick up in the next video. Bye, guys.